The issue of hardness of heart should not come up with us as believers because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. If the love of God is active in the lives of both partners, divorce doesn't have to happen. Previously on Fresh Dew. There were things in the law that were annulled and they were put away because they were contrary to us. There were other things that were good for us, the blessings, for example, and we held on to them. I'm saying this to say that you don't go to the Old Testament and pick up certain things in the law and apply them to yourself now. Now, like I said, in the Old Testament, what was happening was that people could divorce their wives for certain reasons. In Deuteronomy 24, we see that if a man no longer found favor with his wife, because, as the Bible says, something unclean was found in her. It doesn't quite tell us, and scholars are a bit divided on what that uncleanness meant. It can't mean adultery, because adultery was death already. But it says if something unclean was found in her, then the husband could write her a kerithuth, a certificate of divorce, and say, take, go. And the idea was that with that certificate, if she wanted to marry again, she could. With that certificate, the man could not go back and collect dowry on her head because that certificate proves that he drove her away. Well, guess what was happening by the time of Jesus? Men were now writing certificates for their wives for anything. For example, it's written in one of the, one of the commentaries that a woman burnt the bread. That's what was happening. A woman burnt the bread and the husband gave her a certificate of divorce. So like in this dispensation, you're making your husband's favorite okra soup. My husband loves okra soup. So I've told him it's okra while eating and I'm making it with my hand. Then he comes home. He has been dreaming about that okra soup. And I got distracted and the okra soup burnt. And he comes to me and says, what? You burnt my okra soup? Give me paper, give me paper. That's what was happening. And he would write a keritut or in the New Testament, an apostasium, write it and take, turn me away. So the women were no longer protected. The certificate of divorce that Moses put to protect the women so the man wouldn't go back and collect their dowry and she was free to marry again, now turned against them. And at that time, only men were the ones divorcing their wives. Women were not doing that. So this problem didn't start today. So when Jesus came, the situation was that men were now divorcing their wives for any single reason. That's why he was asked the question in Matthew 19, 3 to 10, and Mark 10, 1 to 12. Can we read that, please? Matthew 19, 3 to 10, and Mark 10, 1 to 12. Matthew 19, 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. 
but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And his disciples, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Mark 10, 1 to 12. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? And he answered, he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Mark tells us that they were testing him. So it tells us that the intention of their question wasn't really because of the doctrine. They were trying to set a trap for Jesus. And at that time, there were two schools of thought, two houses of teaching that believed on different reasons for divorce. I won't go into the, 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 the depth of it. And they wanted to see if Jesus would identify with any of the houses. And Jesus understood what they were doing. So he took them back to the beginning and said, what did God say when God set up divorce? God set this up for permanency. In fact, the only reason that God would allow a divorce to take place is adultery. Note that at this time, the law of love had started creeping in because Jesus used adultery. But under the law, adultery was death. But Jesus said, if it's a case of adultery, such and such will happen, showing that he didn't approve of the death penalty, but he approved that adultery should be one of the reasons, or the main reason, why divorce can be allowed. Are you following me? Did you get that at all? Did you get it? If you didn't get it, say so. Let me read some things. It seems, however, that though Jesus did not approve of adultery in marriage, he did not sanction the death penalty for marriage. He brought up an issue. He said, Moses, in fact, that certificate of divorce Moses gave you, he really wouldn't have given you he just gave it to you because of the hardness of your heart. Because you guys are just looking for a reason to get rid of your wives. So Moses gave that. Still pointing back to God's preference is not to have a divorce situation. Are you hearing me? The issue of hardness of heart should not come up with us as believers. Because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. If the love of God is active in the lives of both partners, divorce doesn't have to happen. I'll say it again. If the love of God is active in the lives of both partners, divorce doesn't have to happen. In fact, Kenneth Hagin says that any issue of divorce or separation is an issue of the love of God not being in effect in at least one of the lives of the partners. 
It's an agape love failure. Any divorce situation is an agape love failure. If you walk in agape love and your spouse is walking in agape love, there's no reason for divorce to take place. Glory be to God. So it seems like Jesus was protecting women who had been suffering from casual divorces. So he took a hard line and took them back to the legal code to curb their excesses of casual divorce. Note that the time of Jesus is still not the church of Jesus Christ. If anything, you could say it is the Old Testament. I prefer not to call it the Old Testament because of situations like this, where we saw that he didn't sanction the death penalty. So he was really moving away from the law. The time of grace hadn't come in. So I like to call the years of Jesus the transition period. He was simply transiting. So even then, it's not everything Jesus said, the way and context in which he said it that is applicable to us. The most applicable thing to us is to go to the epistles. Are you following me? We're building this up, so let's keep going. Let's now look at the things that Paul said. There's one portion of scripture where Paul categorically talks about divorce. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 16. Can you read, please? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And her husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord. But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such, such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Again, we see that like, like Jesus, like God, Paul again discouraged divorce. In fact, he's categoric in the issue of one of the people, maybe the husband, is an unbeliever. And the wife is a believer. You don't get up and leave your home because your husband is not saved. But it goes on to say, if, however, your husband gets up and leaves, that's fine. He left. But for you to get up and leave and say, ah, Pastor, you don't know what it's like being married to an unbeliever. We can't pray together. I remember we said earlier that the unequal yoke is both the unbeliever and the very carnal husband. So we can, by extension, apply this. You're a serious sister, but your husband is very carnal. You can't get up and leave because your husband is kind of, as long as he is not leaving you. What you do is what? You do this. You get back on your knees and trust God for change. But as frustrating as it is, because your husband is an unbeliever or is a kind of Christian, Paul is categoric about it. In the first verses, he just says, look, whether you are both believers, you don't just get up and leave for nothing. You don't just get up. A husband should not drive away his wife, and a wife should not drive away her husband. These are all offshoots of what was happening at that time, where the Jews were driving away their spouses, remember context, for just about anything. And both Jesus and Paul were categoric. They wanted to stop this issue 
of careless divorcing. Stop this issue of driving away spouses for just no reason, which is what happens in the world and in the church. When you get so engrossed with your inconvenience, you get so engrossed with your sadness in marriage, it seems justifiable. But with a covenant, it's not like that. You entered a covenant. And just like God, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. That's why for you who is single, you shine your eye before you enter the covenant. And you pray continually for your spouse. You don't wait for Katala to boss before you start praying. You pray for each other, uphold each other. Because any good marriage, Satan comes after it. Because your marriages preach about Christ and the church. I pray for my husband a lot. He prays for me. I don't wait for him to get into trouble, to now start sweating and praying. I pray and uphold him. Because the fact that he's my husband means that he's a target for the enemy. The fact that our marriage is a blessing to so many means it's a target for the enemy. So you don't wait to be fighting defensive. You understand the power of covenant and you reach out to your partner and protect your partner. Amen. But then what happens when these covenant terms, despite all your praying, despite all your faith, your partner repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly breaks the terms of the covenant and what still, your life is in harm's way. What then do you do? Still, before you get down the road of divorce, you see, the thing about divorce is so many stop gaps are put to stop you from getting to that destination. So if you finally get to that destination, it is because every stop gap you have tried didn't work. You have genuinely tried. So let's now look at some of the things you should make sure you have done and considered in full before you end up with a decision for a divorce. Should I continue? Number one, get Christian counseling. Divorce is not something you do in a hurry. First thing you should do is get Christian counsel. Again, get Christian counseling before you have the fire on the mountain. When it's just little sparks, when it's just little sparks, get counsel. I remember somebody coming to me once for counsel. And when she began to recount her story, I found out that she had been in that situation for like 20 years. And I asked her, you've been in this church for 20 years. Why haven't you come? You come when the problem has matured. The problem has a PhD. It has gone to school, it has grown teeth. Why don't you come when the problem is still in Pampas? Why don't you come when the problem is still in kindergarten? Why do you have pride and cover up? Get counseling and get it early. If you both belong to a Bible-believing church, and I assume if you belong to a church, you trust the pastor of the church, then go to the church for counseling. That should be your first bus stop. If you're in a church like the Carpenters Church, we've got, including myself, nine pastors who are full-time. Shabi, we are nine. Who are full-time. Engineer, doctor, accountant, teacher, business woman. Full-time. They all left these jobs. Lawyer. I'm talking about full-time 
just to serve you. Nine pastors. Why would you be suffering in your marriage? People come from outside for counseling with us. We counsel members of many churches. We try to send them back to their churches. They say, no, my pastor cannot help. So we can counsel with you, but we can't follow you up. The best counsel to get is from your pastor who knows you. So you are in a church like this. Why won't you come for counsel? Why? There are a lot of people who are counselors. I have my opinions on that. I agree that they are trained counselors. But I find it interesting when someone is a counselor and either doesn't belong to a local assembly or is obviously not submitted to the pastor of their local assembly. I would run from that person. You. If you're not flexible and nobody can talk to you, you probably will end up in a divorce court. So again, it's something you build up over time. You can't be that person in church that no one can talk to you. You move, and, move in and out on solo. You probably will end up in a divorce court. Are you alive, but not really living life? Do you know somewhere deep down that something needs to change in the course of your life? Does it feel like you have lost your way in life? Yet to others, you seem to know your way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Can you believe that somewhere on the inside of you? Do you believe it? He is the answer to every question. And he loves you just the way you are. Today he's waiting for you with arms open wide. And he wants you just the way you are. Will you make a decision today to surrender your life to him and run into those outstretched arms? If you want to do that, say this prayer out loud from the depth of your heart and you will be saved Lord Jesus I come to you today I believe you are the son of God and that you died for me and rose again just to save me come into my heart and make me brand new as you have promised I will live for you all the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Congratulations on taking the most important decision of your life. You are now born again and a brand new person. It has all happened on the inside of you. Now you need to grow in your new faith. And what has happened on the inside will surely be reflected in your everyday life. We can help you grow in your new faith. Please call us at 0700 Fresh Dew or email us at saved at freshdew.tv and we'll be here for you. Thank you for watching Fresh Dew today with Pastor Nkichi Ene. We trust you were blessed by today's episode. For further information on Fresh Dew, please call us on 0700 Fresh Dew, which is 0700 3737 4339. If you're calling from outside Nigeria, the number will be plus 234 700 3737 4339. Our phones are open from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. GMT plus one. You can also send us an email to info at freshdew.tv and we'll be glad to serve you. We also invite you to like, 
follow and interact with us on our Twitter and Facebook pages at Fresh Dew TV and also on Pastor Nkechi's Facebook pages at Pastor Ketch. For more information on how you can partner with Fresh Dew and receive Pastor Nkechi's monthly letters and weekly MP3 gifts, please visit our website www.freshdew.tv Once again, thanks for being with us today and we look forward to seeing you next time on Fresh Dew to receive fresh inspiration and direction for your life.